Well, that's, well, that's happening. It's it's eleven thirty. So um, yeah, let's get started. We start with I'll just say say at the start then. Um, it's being recorded. Just to remind people, so uh, so there we are. I'm going to be able to share this with other people afterwards. And I've realised this last half hour is recorded as well. So there we are. Our chat is there. Steve Hill is our co-chair, and he'll be monitoring the chat. So if anyone wants to put any, uh, there's a chat icon at the bottom of the screen. If you scroll down, it'll pop up, um, and that will give us panel at the side on the right hand side that you can type in. You have to type in at the bottom of it, which confused me for a while uh, to put there. Steve will monitor that and bring them up. Um, and I think that's really all we need to say at the, uh, at the start. I, so if you're not speaking, please mute to, your mic. Um, yes, that's what I was going to say, actually, David, because, and, and, um, I think Kate mentioned that as well in the chat. Please mute your mic when someone's speaking. Um, I, I will call people, um, for questions. Um, obviously unmute yourself before you speak because we're on here, obviously. Right. Well, if we could invite Margaret to give the AG chairs welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David. Um, so, firstly, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us this morning. Um, I think you know that this, like so many AG events, this this really is in a response to what's going on in the world. And I think we meet at a time when the world is in a state of tumult. Um, and I think probably, if if you're anything like me, I think most of us have found great kinship in different communities. And this morning, you know, I'd gone for a very lovely walk along the banks of the Clyde. And I was really just thinking how much I was looking forward to today, to just seeing everybody. Um, but also just that sense of feeling part of something. And I think and I hope that that is what the AGE provides for all of us, um, that sense of community. And that sense of being a community that actually is helpful, which is why we've organized this event for today because we all are facing challenges around how we operate as journalism educators. So I hope that today we will find lots of information out. I know that we will. We've got a great lineup of speakers both this morning and okay. this afternoon. So and I hope that we get the opportunity right, to share our ideas and to so share our thoughts. To listen to um, that on my phone. Okay, so somebody needs to mute their mic because they sound can't. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I think it's also important that we think about how we move forward. So in the spirit of moving forward, we've also decided which we will share with you next week. Um, we're going to have a second event of this nature on September the 18th because we felt that that would be useful for... Um, most of us who will be preparing to teach within the next few weeks. So a call will go out next week for people to contribute to that. And that will be a morning event, a two hour event on September the 18th. And I think really what that underlines is that we just want to provide um, our AG community with support through these very difficult times. Um, today we also share with you on our website and on our Twitter feed our, um, our statement supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and I would really appreciate it um, if people could maybe have a look at that and could share that and we share that in the full acknowledgement of the challenges that lie ahead um, but also in the real need for us to make really fundamental and, and, and structural changes to how we do things, to how we teach, to how we live our lives. So I hope that you can join in the spirit of that. Um, next thing I just want to do is thank everybody who has been involved in putting this together. So as always, the AG committee in particular, I would like to thank for this morning's session, David, who's chairing it, Steve, who's coordinating the chat and organising the questions, and Vivian, who helped us to get some of the speakers. So thank you to them. And I will do the same thank yous this afternoon, because these things are never done by one person, they're always done by a collective, so thank you. As you know, we have, our, we have had to put the conference back, and we should have been meeting in Sheffield Hallam today, um, and we were really looking forward to that. Um, we very much hope, we've rescheduled the conference for the first week in December. We very much hope we can meet then, but who knows, and we will keep an eye on that and we will keep you informed. In the event we can't physically meet, we will talk and we will consult with you about having an online conference. 
Although I think probably we would all very much like to meet in person sooner rather than later. So I'm going to hand over now to David. Oh, one more thing. We would very much like, and this is a message from Chris Frost, who's the editor of the journal. Um, and we have Sally Ann Duncan on here too. Sally Ann's one of the editors of the journal too. But we very much are looking for your contributions. Um, I have included details about this in each of the newsletters that have gone out recently, uh, but we do want to hear more from you. The last few months have been very quiet in terms of people submitting journal articles, understandably, um, but very much people who do have work, you, you're kicking at an open door at the moment. So Chris is, is ready and waiting for anything that you want to send him. So um, please keep that in mind. And I'm going to hand over now to David um, and say I hope you very much enjoy the first session. Um, thank you again. It's fantastic to see so many familiar faces and I want to call out so many names and I won't do that um, because I've already done that this morning, but it is just lovely to see so many people. So thank you so much for supporting us in our first our first online conference. David, it's all yours. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, if we can move on swiftly then to Alejandro from the University of the Arts in, in London, who's going to talk about retrofitting a, uh, a module for online delivery and personal experience. Great. Um, can you, you all hear me okay? Hear you good. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for the organizers, and particularly uh, Vivian Francis who invited me here. What I'm going to be doing is uh, a very simple, not very you know, scientific or academic paper in any way. I'm just going to be explaining some of the you know, uh, steps that we took to retrofit a particular unit for online delivery. Um, this unit is a first year um, BA journalism unit that um, is a 20 credit unit and it explores mainly theory and history issues around journalism. Some of the topics that we uh, traditionally explore are things like freedom of expression today, global news and networks and propaganda, digital public sphere and fake news and post truth. These are a continuation of the um, theory line of units that we explore during the first year. Traditionally, the unit has been um, divided into lectures, seminars, and student presentations. And it's a 12-week unit that runs through second and third term. Um, although I am the unit leader uh, at London College of Communication, I teach this unit alongside my um, colleague, uh, Russell Merriman, who I think is actually present here. So this has been very much a uh, share experience and kind of a share learning opportunity. So when I talked about retrofitting a unit, uh, what I mainly mean here is adjusting some of the elements of that unit. Uh, in this case, um, I just want to explain a little bit about what the adjusting of the assignment brief meant, what the adjusting of the teaching materials meant for us, adjusting the delivery of the unit, and finally ex exploring some of the expectations that we need to readjust, not just uh, us as, as lecturers and, and tutors, but also the expectations that we have of our own students. This, um, this is an interesting unit because we were able to teach uh, half of it in the traditional sense. Then we have the Easter break, and then um, we have to quickly, very, cheaply, very quickly move into an online only delivery. So we have pretty much just three weeks to rethink how we can deliver the unit um, during the Easter break. So it was a bit of a frantic moment. So I hope that our experiences might be useful for those who perhaps didn't have to teach in the last term or like us uh, had to be doing this for the first time. Um, as I said, this is uh, just an explanation or kind of an exploration of our own experiences. So I apologize if perhaps the insights are not very insightful or it feels a little simple, but um, hopefully somebody will find it useful. So when we talked, or when I, I talked about adjusting the assignment brief, um, it's important to recognize that some of these decisions are taken at a unit level, but of course others come from higher up. So we need to coordinate or to you know, match our expectations with those from um, the college, the school, or even uh, the university. In our case, we have to rethink the as uh, assignment. Traditionally, um, it you know, included a 1,500 word um, essay alongside an in-class presentation, a debate of a particular statement that students needed to uh, support or challenge. However, because of the uh, emergency, we had to um, move from the element um, assignment to a more holistic assignment with a single deadline that produced, of course, a certain level of anxiety within students, but the whole exercise was trying to minimize those, those anxiety levels. 
We also moved from a graded unit to a pass-fail submission. This was a decision taken, uh, I think, at a university level, so that all first-year um, uh, units uh, were going to be just pass-fail. We had some uh, interesting conversation with students. Some of them found it uh, very useful, and it decreased their level of anxiety. Others really wanted to know what their final mark would be. So we decided to find kind of a, a compromise in which we uh, just make notes of the final mark for our, for our mm, on kind of uh, formats. And then if, uh, keen students wanted to know exactly what they got, they could come and talk to us directly. So that's pretty much how we uh, adjust the assignment brief. But of course, we also had to adjust the teaching materials. And the first thing that we did was um, have some presentations, some videos ready before students actually engage with the content of the unit. So they will uh, be getting used to how to access, for example, eBooks or how to navigate the online platform in which the seminars uh, were gonna be taking place. These took some time, but I think it was important for us to have them ready before the students um, uh, came back to us. Um, and again, spending some time and designing these activities in a way in which students are at the forefront of your thinking, what are gonna be their issues, uh, proved very useful so that um, we had just to spend one session introducing these tools and these techniques. Um, and it actually works. Students, as we know, they are uh, much more um, used to these technologies, so they were able to uh, very quickly understand not just the technicalities of it, but even also things like the etiquette of you know raising your hand before uh, uh, talking or opening and closing their microphone and the cameras. So it was useful to have that material so that students um, could always go back to them if, if they weren't there, for example, on the first week, or um, they could kind of remind themselves what, how they, the particular technologies um, that we were using were all about. We also uh, added additional um, material because uh, particularly the first few weeks we had uh, a lot of uh, advice coming from the top saying that we needed to design the, the units uh, taking in consideration the kind of classic distinction of synchronic and asynchronic learning. And uh, it was important for us to uh, provide a lot of material for those who perhaps felt that uh, the reduction on face-to-face -face interaction with lecturers will take away um, their teaching experience. So this is pretty much how one uh, week uh, looked for in our um, uh, a unit with a combination of readings and uh, documentaries and podcasts uh, around the topic that we were discussing. Um, and uh, we also uh, experimented for the first time with some of the Moodle activities. We use this particular uh, environment, Moodle. Uh, I'm sure different universities use different environments, but um, I can imagine that most of these um, environments allowed for the creation of things like quizzes and glossaries and forums so that uh, the discussion that traditionally happened on seminars uh, could happen online. Um, these, uh, as I'm going to be uh, mentioning later on, uh, prove, um, I wouldn't say controversial, but some students really enjoy these. Others find it a, a little bit too much for them, but it was definitely a way for those uh, overachieving students, those who were perhaps more concerned about missing out um, to engage more uh, deeply with, particularly with the theory-based readings or with some of the documentaries. So for them, for some really enhance their, their learning and kind of experience. Things like um, online forums, uh, we also experimented with. We had also a good uh, uptake and uh, it just allows for peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, peer -peer conversation, which of course um, is very important, not just for uh, kind of the learning outcomes, but also for the sense of community that students um, are looking for when they come to university. We also uh, had to adjust the delivery uh, of the unit. Um, and the first thing that we uh, decided to is to produce a weekly uh, announcement in the form of an email in which all the activities and all the steps that students need to take that week had to be spelled out very often with links directly to the activities or the readings that they had to do. This is important because of course they were receiving a lot of information coming from other units and from the university themselves. So it, it would have been easier to get lost in uh, you know, an avalanche of emails. So we decided to have a single way of communicating. And this, of course, also made the job easier for us because uh, by trying to spell uh, step by step what they needed to do, 
Um, we also avoid a, a lot of emails coming directly from uh, students asking us what exactly they were expected to do each week. Council we council. Um, uh, produce a lot uh, of... Um, the, uh, the job they're going to do on our... Great. 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 Could we mute mics, okay. please? I think someone's coming in there. Great. Uh, just Sorry, to mention that um, the lectures were recorded. Uh, we created um, uh, Office 365 stream channel in which all these lectures were collected. Students were able to access them. Directly, these lectures were uh, recorded lectures of the traditional uh, slides, presentations that we uh, give in a lecture hall. And finally, we have um, a weekly seminars in which um, a, a group of around between 50 and 20 students would come up, discuss the lecture, discuss the readings, and also conduct some uh, kind of seminar type of activities, discussions in smaller groups and answering poll questions, stuff like that. So overall, that's how we retrofit a theory unit into an online delivery um, or online only um, uh, unit. And some of the expectations, some of kind of the takeaways uh, of this exp experience is that existing units can be retrofitted, but they require some planning and effort. Uh, we don't have to start from zero. Um, in, in our case, it had to be done very, very abruptly. So it was a little bit of experimentation. Students still prefer synchronic teaching even when we know that perhaps not all of them have a uh, uh, good internet speed and that we need to uh, also take in consideration other sorts of um, uh, uh, needs. Uh, so they will engage in, in this type of forums and quizzes, but just if they are uh, directed, if there is kind of clear communication with the tutor. Seminars in online environments work, but they need additional guidance. And recorded lectures are consulted, but they could be open to, student, uh, to students. So for the next term, I think I would experiment with having the lectures live uh, and inviting everybody who wants to, to be there, uh, but still record them so that uh, that combination of synchronic and asynchronic uh, can be useful. Uh, to highlight that peer-to-peer -peer interactions are, are hard in these environments. I mean, they are hard normally in seminars, making them talk to each other sometimes can feel like a, like a struggle. Uh, in online uh, environments are particularly difficult, but they are of course very, very worthy. Um, especially if we take in consideration that uh, element of sociability that we need to bring. And finally, uh, also to know that students will engage uh, in online uh, teaching at a different level. Some of them will be very enthusiastic. We had some feedbacks from students saying that they almost even enjoy more than, than having us there. This idea of additional readings and quizzes, um, just learning on their own time. Some of them, especially the high achievers, found it very stimulating. Others, of course, uh, didn't. But overall, uh, we could see that the uptake of, of these activities and the atten uh, attendance really pretty much mapped the, the traditional kind of normal movement. And I just wanted to finish up by um, kind of highlighting the idea that um, this is an opportunity, or it was an opportunity, and it's still an opportunity for me to reassess my own practice and to rethink the overall objectives of the university education. It was interesting that David uh, uh, mentioned um, our colleague Praya Rajeska, um, uh, article in the DHE because um, I think she puts it very nicely that this online classroom will, exp will expose inequalities cool. and it is definitely an opportunity for change, for positive change and, and again for kind of reassessment. So that's my presentation. Thank you Alejandro. That, that's, that's a very thought-provoking piece there. Can I pass over to you Steve to pick, pick up on questions that yeah, have been raised? Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, thank you for that presentation. That was brilliant. I just wanted to ask, first of all, for myself, um, what was the kind of breakdown of synchronous versus um, asynchronous classes? Um, did you have sort of a, a percentage in mind? We didn't, uh, sorry, yeah, we didn't at the beginning, but we, um, we knew that uh, we wanted to provide at least uh, two hours of seminar time for our students. Um, how we kind of... Uh, structure it was to have a lecture that was recorded um, then have activities uh, that will take around four hours to complete on their own and then have two hours seminars so percentage wise i would say perhaps 20 percent 20 percent of uh synchronous the rest of it asynchronous oh. So can we mute microphones please yeah we've got so he was what claire is have you got your microphone on? Okay, um, <laughs> maybe that's cleared it up. Um, Hello, it's not me. No, I've got everything off. 
Oh, right. Okay, sorry, not, not, not Claire, um, not you, Claire. Um, there's another Claire on the line, but don't, don't worry. Um, yeah, host, host can actually mark, um, mute or microphones, David. I don't know if you want to give that a go, maybe. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on. Um, Kate, um, did you have a, a question? Um, Kate Ironside, do you want to switch your microphone on? Yeah, no, I thought that was really interesting. I just wanted to know um, how, do, how many students had problems accessing um, the Collaborate seminars. I, I reckon we had probably about a fifth who will be crashing in and out. Uh, which actually makes it very difficult for them. Um, we were surprised because coming up with any methods of supporting mm. those students who are locked into bad Wi-Fi because this yeah. all depends on their Wi-Fi. We were in fact surprised how few students really have trouble with it. Of a cohort of uh, perhaps 40 students, we just had two who had uh, some of these this kind of bandwidth uh, troubles. Uh, what we try to do is, of course, communicate directly with them, pointing out to the asynchronic activities that they could do and just offer additional uh, uh, tutorial time if it was required. It is, it is difficult. And uh, I, I also understand that there is uh, kind of an element of inequality, particularly for those mm -hmm. who had to go back to their uh, country of origins that perhaps don't have um, a reliable internet connection. I didn't also mention that we have some international students that had to take uh, the kind of uh, the, the time difference in consideration. However, um, overall, um, perhaps of the because of the demographic of our students, most of them had good quality internet and were uh, very keen on having um, kind of synchronic interactions. That's why we we thought of perhaps uh, in the future offer it um, as an addition um, for students to be able to be present on the lectures but of course record and provide also asynchronous opportunities for those who had struggle. So in our case, um, it was actually a, a very small minority. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. I know there'll be other people asking questions there. Perhaps we could, we could make some space over the lunch hour, lunch hour for that. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, Franja online? Hello, yes. Hello. Hello. Can I introduce Franja Hall again? from uh, the University of Arts in London, the College of Communication, and that follows ideally on from uh, Alejandro's on finding a rhythm to online learning for faculty and students. Yes, hopefully you can see the screen. Um, oh, hang on, I need to put it in screen yep. mode. There. Um, yes, so I'm um, here um, as a, I'm a course leader for the MA in publishing and I teach on the um, BA magazine journalism and publishing um, and really some of this stuff is coming from my role as the teaching and learning lead at the media school um, at LCC um, so it's less specific to a particular unit and more about how I, I was working with the teaching and learning team about thinking about students and their week weekly sort of working. Um, there was obviously an immediate shift that we moved into, um, which was obviously a very fast learning curve for a lot of us. Um, we were looking at supporting live sessions with in asynchronous ones, obviously, and I know that's come up quite a lot in the chat as well. Um, overcoming time zones, as Alejandra mentioned. Um, Pre-recording audio only, so that those with lower bandwidth could still access the the PowerPoint, you can have it as a PowerPoint, but also have it as audio and also as video. So depending on what sort of you, how you preferred to consume your um, material, you could have choices like that. Um, and we were trying to look at how to get the asynchronous learning environments used a little bit more proactively and consistently. And I know that's come up in the chat. I mean, I'm not sure we solved any of those problems yet, but it was just some something that was immediately sort of coming up because we knew we'd have less sort of face-to-face -face time with the students. Um, so we looked at planning out a week originally to make the students feel more supported because when they were out of the structure, their week structure sort of fell apart. They were just sitting at home with nothing. Um, and so that's partly why the synchronous sessions were still so fruitful for them, even though we know there's a lot of challenges in about inclusivity um, in that. Um, we were also looking at ways to keep a sense of community continuing through lockdown and give shape for a sort of shapeless week. So there was more scaffolding on their independent learning than we probably would do normally because it was a case of trying to keep them focused on that because that was 
going to become so much more important. But I would certainly reinforce that scaffolding doesn't mean simplifying. Um, we were really trying to see what a pattern of a week would look like. And also re really recognising that at, the, at this particular point of lockdown, peer-to-peer -peer learning was going to be important and how to keep that community still going when they're not in the classroom together. And again, not really solved that particularly, but we're trying that was behind the scenes, the immediate shifts that we had to move into. Um, there have been benefits to this whole sort of way of thinking about synchronous and asynchronous teaching. Obviously, there's a bit of flexibility for scheduling for the students side of things. Also, lots of the resources, because we're suddenly having to make them available in, in video and uh, um, audio environments, they're, they're futures. Um, there's a much more focus on helping students make use of independent learning. I think we always have found it's a challenge to get them to recognize how central that is to their their way of working and I know that I, I do work a lot with the MA level and clearly the independent learning is more part of the MA experience but clearly still important for the undergraduates as well um, so more focus on active engagement with the forums and the blogs um, you know again not necessarily solved that really recognizing that bite size was important very long lectures that went on and on was very much more difficult to fit in um, and for them to be nimble to go back to um, so actually having these creating much smaller chunks which you then build into a larger lecture it actually means you can be quite nimble about realigning the curriculum in the future um, accessibility obviously a lot of bits there are I mean, it was wonderful to put stuff into streams up for you. Um, so that students who need the time to be careful slowly, especially if they're international. Uh, supporting the learning styles, engage more peer learning, uh, reinforcing learning through the week, through the independent activity and just sitting in the lecture theatre and then sort of disregarding everything for the rest of the week. Bringing in other learning spaces that, we're more used, that they're more used to, like social media environments, which we do anyway, but, but it, it sort of forced all this a little bit more to the forefront. And also I realised that you had to get a lot more precise about timings. Um, when you look at MOOCs, for instance, there's a lot more precision about read times. And I thought actually that's quite useful for, for supplying resources in a way that's very um, accessible and easy for the students to bespoke their own learning experience. But clearly there are challenges. There's a lot of students on the margins who are in danger of slipping out in, a, in an online environment. You need to be very proactive engagement forums I'm um, in the seminars you've got to produce the same content in many different formats you've got to keep students progressing um, looking forward not just picking and mixing bits and pieces um, you've got to have freedom and creativity for experimentation but you know, with a purpose there's always the problem about more practical work um, where things are done in studios and the critique the confidence of critique is, is more difficult in an online environment um, and it's not just fun technology stuff. Uh, also recognizing not to overuse tools and throw in too many and, and help the students feel responsible to each other. That was quite difficult. That actually by commenting on somebody else's bloom, which we always try and get them to do anyway, is a challenge. Um, and also the whole thing just generated huge amounts of announcements, cluttered inboxes. We all had that. It was a nightmare <laughs> for everybody. And so students could quite easily lose direction, particularly if they find structuring maybe more difficult if they have dyslexia or something. So although you need to give them the announcements, it's also about helping them curate those. Just throw in a bit of sort of pedagogy in the way of thinking as we move on to the, the rhythm part of it, um, without saying much more, thinking of experiential learning as a sort of process for a student to think about the way they learn, and also community of inquiry around presences, thinking about your presence. We're only, I'm only really beginning to, to really tackle this, but thinking about social teaching and cognitive presences when you look at, in the future at blended uh, options, which I guess we are all looking at now. Um, so I was looking at a way to co-create the weekly learning rhythm with the students, um, helping with the structure, encouraging them to think about their own learning week and take some ownership over this sort of process. You know, Alejandro has shown how much you could put together to curate a course, a wonderful unit, a wonderful day, week of work, but you now need to help them feel empowered to sort of run with it, um, make them feel they're progressing, um, keep them present, keep you present in their learning. Um, so I was looking at ways to visualize working 
week with them and reinforce how important those independent activities were and the peer to peer stuff. So the next, the rest of the slides are really just different ways of visualizing this. And the first set are really me visualizing it in different ways. So I was trying to give them a sense of their rhythm so that they would see you are. Uh, that they're prepared they're preparing stuff the new content was really the bit where you came in um, with the new stuff for that week well, the syn synchronous things um the new um maybe uh, the live session but also the recorded session that they might listen to on demand then really building in the blog and forum as ex expectations in my case i was running a blog and a forum um they had slightly different angles on them but that that was part of what they have to do that's part of it and then actions was focused on their um uh, their actual assignment activities. Um, another way of looking at it was sort of trying to give them a bit of structure on a daily basis so that they could choose when they did things. Um, roughly speaking, all the actions and prep were a certain color coding way of doing it. And then the bits where new stuff was going to come at them in some form or other is in, in orange. This is some color coding. Again, just a way of looking at it. Um, I've done this rather roughly in Excel. Uh, maybe a more organic way of thinking that you could see there's lots of different things that you're learning from. It's also reinforcing that students, they're learning from everything, not just the one moment they're sitting in front of you in a lecture theatre. All of these other things play a part. Um, and sort of by showing this is the new content material, whether it's a live class or a video, is only one part of this whole process. It's sort of reinforced what we all know about, about learning. So it's another way of looking at it. Um, a slightly more busy <laughs> post again about there's a lot of variety here and just organize yourself around these different areas of link but also I was aware of bringing in all the other things we know we've all got these fantastic teams that are doing academic support the technical people the library and they should also be sort of foregrounded as places to go I think in our case some of these areas have been slightly forgotten by the students because academic support keeps saying I'm just sitting here waiting for people to help and they're not coming so this was a way of helping that this uh, that's a long screen it's broken down again some students perhaps need more of a daily sense of what they're meant to do are organized around the moment that they're actually sort of getting the new content so this was more of a sort of day-to-day -day thing with expectations built into it um, still choices about when they could do things but a little bit more of that and again um, just another way of visualizing it so those were sort of ways that i did it but of course you can give them all that stuff and they don't necessarily take much notice of it so i then sort of got them and this was an ma group uh but i would do it with undergraduates but i happened to because i can had access to the bas i did that uh the mas i did that um i got them to visualize it so that then they take much more ownership over it help them create their own structure um and so the following diagrams are just their ways of visualizing it. It was fascinating for me. We've learned a lot from how they view their work. And these, these are slightly more specific to lockdown and others are more just generally about um, how they like to learn. And some of them actually do include things that they had to remember to do like our weekly registers. Um, so here we have a lovely one from um, uh, a, a Chinese student who was really looking at the differences between what she would always have to do on particular days, what she would do daily and what she would have occasionally. This was another person who saw the sort of week structure, but other things to put in and then resources. I thought that was quite a nice way of looking at it. Um, Pie chart, very interesting. Of course, some students just see it as how do I divide up my time? That was an interesting one. I, I know it's difficult to read. Or well, this one was the sort of circle and he started bringing in a few more of his L, things he does outside of class. Just two more to go. Um, again, an, an, another couple of ways of visualizing it, breaking it down into what you might do daily, where you check in, sort of visual reminders of what you had to do, what to review and to prepare. This one broke it down into sort of actions to do with class and personal sort of actions and checklists. And then this was perhaps my favourite one. This is her way of viewing her week. And she also brings in her other things that she was doing, um, her personal well-being things um, with her sunbathing and her coffees uh, but again I think I mean with his early days I would try this again because we haven't actually then got them to see does this help them understand but I think it's certainly got them much more focused on these other elements of learning and developing their own rhythm around the structure that you put in place uh, and I think that's the end so I shall stop there
Thank so that's you, Claire. Thank through you. some of that. Quick, just a couple of minutes for um, contributions and questions. Over to you, okay. Steve. Um, yeah, the, many thanks for that. Um, Maria, Maria Ahmed, you had a few things to ask, I think, if you're on the line. I noticed that you've, re you've asked something uh, about um, equality of engagement. And I think at this stage, we'd, uh, God, evaluation is so important. And I think we're just at the beginning of learning how to, to evaluate. It's something I've, I haven't got much advice on at this stage. Um, but I would say that we now need to learn a whole load of slightly different ways of thinking about evaluation in an online environment. Um, so I'm just starting to look at that. Beyond in the MAs, we're a little bit more focused on on en engaging with it anyway, but um, without getting very focused in on how I, you know, checking on forums and things. And I, I don't have anything very insightful to offer, I'm afraid, on that at the moment. Brilliant. And what about uh, Catherine? Do you want to ask your question, Blair? Catherine Blair? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how many is your on course? Because when you're talking about like daily activities where they have to do pre reading and then um, watching the lectures and then the chats and things, is that for how many modules were they doing? Because um, I'm just I'm just wondering if you know some of our um, levels the, they might have six classes so it's, it's just kind of wondering the, about the balance of work if they're checking in on each module each day yeah well we didn't expect them to check in on each thing each day so what we did is we gave them so within the between by um the thursday afternoon of any given week you should have put in your comment on the d discussion forum which and we set them a task um, for a discussion forum. So in one sense, it wasn't like oh they really had a whole day schedule. That was just to help them think about planning their day. And to some extent, that's more lockdown than anything else. But if you're going to do, you've got to do the discussion forum sometime. Which day is best for you? So it wasn't as uh, we didn't particularly stipulate that beyond a, a deadline. Um, but it's true in this case, they were sort of MA students who didn't have um, they only had two modules on. So it was easier for them to manage and also I think they tended to structure it quite a lot around they had nothing else to do because they're all at home but obviously in real future they will have jobs so I think it's still helpful but they would have they would have to factor in something else for me it was just interesting to see how far they acknowledged the peer-to-peer -peer stuff which actually I found the most difficult that they should respond to each other uh, they were always wanting to respond back to you which is a a sort of problem longer term. And yeah, thank you very much for that. So there's, there's lots of really important material there that uh, uh, I've, I've certainly been picking up on. Um, if we can uh, pass on to uh, Karen now, Karen Fowler Watts of Bournemouth University. And this is something that's come up a couple of times already then, is, is, is building a community and also on the, the normative topics and the shape of journalism. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thank you. Really um, interesting reflections from um, everybody, I think, and some of, some of the ideas will definitely be here. But um, the aim of this talk is to share reflections on the move to online from a group of us. Um, so moving from our individual areas of interest and expertise to a sort of collective set of reflections, a little bit more on the group in a moment. Uh, so looking first at the last weeks of teaching, um, as we were in, sort of immersed in the crisis and our responses to that, then looking ahead to consider how these reflections can help us perhaps to prepare for online, probably blended delivery in 2021. And then to look at how we can draw on perhaps educational research and theory, which is an area of focus for us in the Centre for Excellence in Media Practice. And to think about how these reflections, very early reflections from us and our responses map to the requirements of journalism practice, which are also themselves shifting in response to crisis. Um, but keeping student fo focused learning at the heart of the discussion as, as colleagues have so far on, on these talks. So just I'm representing the individual reflections of um, presented collectively of a small group of journalism educators, as I mentioned. Um, we are the journalism education research group as a, as, a, as a group, myself working clockwise, Andy Bissell, who some of you know, Mim Phillips, Dave Bryan, Gray Majin, Jaron Murphy and Mike Sunderland. And the guiding principle of us as a group is that we focus on the human aspects of journalism practice and education and some of you who perhaps heard me talk about about that before would know that's um, a, a thing that we're interested in and the importance of listening rather than telling 
So um, we think about transformative pedagogy, how we might reimagine journalism education with an emphasis on community, as David said, diversity of voices, something that's more crucial now than ever, empathy and self-reflection. And of course, these reflections are still taking shape and we're tussling with many of the issues. So I really appreciate having this forum for discussion. So our starting point was one that I'm sure many of us have taken some time to think about, that journalists usually report on crisis, but the pandemic places journalists, like everyone else, in the crisis. And this was exemplified in the reflections of BBC correspondent Fergus Walsh after he put on full PPE to report from the front line of an ICU, which I'm sure many of you saw in the heart of the pandemic. He said that no story had ever affected him so profoundly. So living in the crisis presents unique challenges to us as journalism educators as well. And we are trying to teach students how to report on it and to train as journalists while living in it. This is a unique experience, I think. So the areas we've reflected on are the impact on journalism's normative values, which are founded on the principle of impartiality, teaching industry accredited skills to a group of Facebook community reporters who a couple of my colleagues were training for their NCTJ exams as lockdown hit. And also our own students, we're an NCTJ accredited and BJTC accredited course, as well as PPA. So we have many um, bases to cover there. Original storytelling is another thing we've thought about whilst we're part of the story and we're locked down, not able to get out of the office. Um, managing student wellbeing across all levels of all programmes as the crisis took hold within a digital space. Teaching final year undergraduate students my own professional perspectives module, which has a focus on marginalised voices and journalists, students identities as practitioners. These were all thrown into disarray by the pandemic. And our cohort of international postgraduate students who had to get back home whilst trying to complete complex investigative journalism assignments. So our responses to crisis, um, at very short notice to these challenges, is something I'll look at now. And then I'm going to turn and look at how our reflections on these short-term responses might help prepare for sustained online or blended teaching and learning in the coming academic year. So we, we embrace subjectivity, we embrace that shift in the normative values and the fact we're living in the story. And one example comes from my colleagues who teach um, television journalism, who got the their first year students to produce mobile survival videos with their phones, and they were allowed to interview their families, something we never normally allow. As for example, ITV Wales, uh, Rob Osborne did uh, with his two metre boom mic. So um, the one example is here, it's a photograph of it. There's a link there on the slides, which I'll share later if anyone wants to have a look at what the students produced. It's on our externally facing website. Our colleagues who were teaching Facebook community reporters had to find new ways of building community from their bedrooms. The communities that they were being trained to work in suddenly weren't physically available to them. So we shifted the focus to contacts building, to source stories without getting out, and also building resilience because many of them were finding that they were vaulted into new roles and having to deal with grief and loss in a way that they never had before. And this is something that um, my colleagues who were working with them also felt that they were having to, to deal with in a way that they had never dealt with before as well. So these were new challenges for, for them as educators. We noted as well within our prof professional skills teaching that feedback on this teaching was received very differently in a virtual space. So we had to think about the tone, we were not face to face whilst upholding the standards with their NCTJ exams looming. And that, that's something that we're definitely thinking about as we move forwards. Whilst we usually focus a great deal on what students are becoming, a particular research interest of one of our, one of our um, colleagues, Andy Bissell, the focus shifted to belonging and managing well-being. What community were they a part of? And how did they feel about what they were training to do? When we did look at becoming and discussions on identity, which is something I do within my own teaching, these focused on resilience, trauma training, questioning journalistic authority in the context of crisis and thinking about whose voices were heard. And when thinking about inclusivity, some students saw journalists themselves as marginalized, as for example, in this handout from one of my students, which I'm sharing here. Um, so they were really engaging with the disarray that they had been thrown into within, within this virtual space and within discussions online. 
and for the international postgraduate students, a responsive and pragmatic pandemic pedagogy of care had to be developed in response to their assignments. They were returning to places all over the world. And many of them, as other colleagues have already mentioned in their talks, were disappearing as a result of that from our screens. So here I've thought about our shifting shape as journalism educators, even if we're moving into blended learning and teaching, I think some of these things are hopefully relevant and might spark discussion. The reflections that we have, our initial reflections are here in black. And then the considerations as we pre prepare for moving online in 2020-21 are in blue. Um, and I've done this through engaging with key principles drawn from research into online pedagogy, um, supported by colleagues within the Centre of Excellence who, who, who know much more about this than, than, than perhaps we might as individuals. So we saw the pandemic as a catalyst um, which redraws the boundaries of the journalistic field within journalism practice. People like Rob Osborne are interviewing their parents, their mother. Um, so we're seeing this as perhaps we will respond through training for mobile video, new approaches to storytelling and this idea which the research informs us to teach through the screen and many people have already talked about asynchronous teaching as well. Uh, we've produced some videos and some masterclasses to back up what we're encouraging the students to do themselves that they can watch at any time. The renewed focus on community is a, is a red thread running through this whole presentation and through our thinking. With the Facebook community reporters we looked at sources and contact building from ground up, dynamic practices within the educational um, theory, um, things that can really equip them for the future and, and provide resilience. There are tensions between upholding professional standards and the way that we need to give feedback in order to do that. And with online NCTJ exams looming, we're looking closely at assessment design and feedback mechanisms, thinking about clarity, consistency and tone. Wellbeing has been moving centre stage in HE for some time, as we acknowledge. Uh, belonging is imperative and becoming perhaps can wait. We need to think about social and pastoral spaces where we can foster empathy within flattened hierarchies where staff and students are seen within their own living rooms and their own bedrooms as they're speaking to each other. Um, a spotlight on marginalised voices in journalism practice, something that I'm particularly interested in, looking for places and ways of co-creating. Fani was talking about this, spaces for discussion and exploration to shape the journalistic self um, that are collaborative and dialogic. And then compassion as a pedagogical principle is emerging from all of this. Perhaps we can manifest this in flexible design, pragmatic approaches, realistic responses, whilst retaining quality and depth, crucial particularly at, at all levels, but at level seven, master's level, teaching with international students, high expectations, but remaining student focused. So to conclude, an emergent theme captured here in a recent quote from Francisco Marmalejo, who was uh, formerly of the World Bank, but spoke recently at a Salzburg Global Seminar Conference on Education Disrupted and Education Reimagined. And he talks about, yes, employability is important, but integral, responsible citizens um, who are committed to their community with a broad perspective on what happens in the world, a global outlook, are crucial. So to conclude, this series of reflections illustrates how our collective interest in the human side of journalism has been placed under a bright spotlight during lockdown and how the move to a digital space has encouraged new ways of thinking about community voice, empathy, about our practice as journalists and educators. Many of the industry standards are shifting due to this new normal of social distancing and we see a pedagogy of compassion emerging from our pragmatic response to crisis while still seeking salience in telling the stories of others, even when we're part of that story. And I've just added a couple of slides with references and a very useful resource, I think, from Coventry University, on which might help us in terms of the way we're thinking about, about these issues around care, community, well-being, and empathy. So thank you very much. Karen, thank you. Um particularly like the, the focus there on community and, and compassion and sort of pedagogical principle. Um, that's, that's really important. Steve, over to you. Uh, yeah, um, this question. many thanks for that. Um, many people in the chat, and I was just going to ask this generally, are asking about the difficulties in giving feedback either kind of one-to-one -one in an online setting or in um, a group uh, forum. Um, 
do, would you like to talk a bit about that? Because you, you mentioned that in the presentation, that there were some difficulties. In yeah, I think it was particularly um, my colleagues who are working um, to teach students not only for credit bearing modules, but also for the NCTJ exams, where, um, you know, it's really important. Well, we all know that within Newsday environments, within any environment, we give robust feedback. And it's very different when you're face to face, we're having worked all day often shoulder to shoulder, I'm sure we'll look at this a bit more as the day goes on, with students as to when you're writing, even if they're getting written feedback in both spaces, virtual and, and physical, the way that they are responding to that feedback can be very different when the only connection you have with them is through the screen. So our initial thoughts are definitely around the tone and the way that we're writing that feedback whilst also maintaining standards which is important and clearly this is you know right down to grammar and, and the, all of that so th those things won't change but it's about the way we present it and then perhaps thinking about new spaces and new ways that we can present it as well and talk around it uh, with, with, with large numbers of students as well. Sure. Okie dokie um, and what about um, a large number of people also asking about the kind of software that um, we use um, you know uh, at Westminster we use Blackboard, obviously Collaborate, Ultra, some people are using Teams, some people are using um, Zoom. Um, I don't know whether you've had any experience of other tools um, other, than, other than the ones that you use at Bournemouth. Yeah, we, I mean, we've been using Zoom mainly. There's big discussions going on there as well. Um, we've been teaching through Zoom. We're just, I think the institution or license is just about to be signed off. We've been doing most of most things that we've done through, through Zoom so far. Um, and we use a VLE, which is Brightspace, which is um, a blackboard and which has forums and all sorts of different ways of engaging with students, yeah. Okay. They're very um, similar, I think, to others. There's quite a lot going on about compassion as a pedagogical principle as well. And um, people asking what sort of theory we've drawn on there. Um, the Auerbach and Hall article, which I mentioned in the slides, is a really interesting one in terms of urging um, um, care as to be placed at the centre of our, our educational approaches. Okay, great. I'll respond okay, David. To great. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. It's great. Uh, Avril, um, are you here? Avril Gray of Napier. I'm here. Oh, Can brilliant. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Can I introduce you then? And, and um, it's a point that seems to flow on naturally from uh, the last one where we we're talking about, about accreditation and such like, and, and, and placements for students, which are, and, and employability, I think you're going to uh, help us with. So take it away. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, is that okay? Yep, that's good. Great. Um, so uh, thank you very much um, for hosting this really important um, discussion. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about um, on the ground um, trying to complete a placement module um, while under lockdown, um, which uh, required uh, the team um, and the students to uh, face a number of challenges. And I know that um, it's quite similar to many of you in your institutions. Um, but I'm going to talk with particular regard um, to the fact that most students um, see a placement as being going to a place of work and the relevancy and importance of this for the majority of students, note I don't say all of students, is intricately linked to the physical experience. So the question I'm going to pose today is there still a place for placement in our programmes? So I thought I'd maybe do a quick overview of our particular uh, program. So um, I'm program leader of um, a postgraduate publishing program at Edinburgh Napier University. And, and that in, its, in itself has um, limitations. Um, we are not in London, um, so we don't have necessarily the resources of the larger publishers. Um, but we do have, and it's really good to hear um, this talk about community um, from the previous speakers, we do have a really um, um, strong community and connection with the publishers um, that exist in Scotland. And the placement itself is a core module, it's compulsory for all students and it is credit bearing. Um, there's a number of components to the assessments and um, during the process of, of this um, pandemic we have been um, upgrading and updating and developing those components but for the purposes of this year um, we were able to continue the assessment with um, a slight adjustment in terms of timescale. 
um, and, and that was done under and, and with consultation with the students themselves. I'll talk more about how we reviewed the, the module um, shortly. Um, but we're a year-long programme, we've got three trimesters, and up until very recently the students were asked to complete the placement in trimester two. Um, one of the adjustments we've made is now that we're going to um, run the placement um, in trimester one, two, and three. And even that, um, that decision to run the placement has, has required a great deal of consideration and thought um, by the programme team and, and is still, I have to admit, under consideration as we adjust to the ever-changing situation. Um, so publishing uh, as journalism is grappling with a number of uh, critical ethical questions and really great to hear um, Margaret talk this morning when we, were, we met uh, about the um, diversity and inclusion issue. And I've felt that this is, I'm sure we all do, feel that this is critically important um, from when I joined academia. And it's an issue that spurred me to establish the placement module over 10 years ago. And I think uh, at that time we were one of the first universities to, um, to have a credit bearing placement. And um, the decision was also influenced by the fact that our university, um, and that's where this idea of place comes into it, because we're always thinking about obviously the context of where we situate a module. Um, but our university has and does attract a high number of students from working class backgrounds. Many of our students are first members of their family to attend university. And, and, and we know that no student can work for free, um, but um, very few companies can actually pay to, uh, to have a student come in on a placement, no matter how much they would want to. Um, so it's important to have these parameters of um, place and time and reward and that's the credit bearing um, point of that module. At understanding that the placement module is challenging for a variety of reasons, um, we have always had an alternative assessment. Um, but interestingly enough, this year, only a few handful of students actually chose to complete the alternative assessment. I can talk about that in the questions if you like. Um, but today I'm going to look in particular at the magazine placements we provide. I'm going to look at the reference to lessons brought through from the book publishing industry. And as I mentioned, it's situated with our context with being in Scotland and the fact that many of our placements are conducted in Scotland. So when we think about um, placements, um, one of the first things that students would talk about is this ability to network, to make this human contact um, uh, with individuals, uh, not only just to learn and demonstrate their skills, um, but also to, to think about how they can um, have conversations, make these connections, build a community so that they can uh, access a job. And you may have noticed at the start of this uh, talk, I played around a little bit with the idea of the word placement. And, and I think it's really interesting to discuss the language and terminology surrounding what we can think about um, as sometimes a work experience, a placement, an internship, sometimes this is paid, sometimes this is not paid, sometimes it's called traineeships, and these can change from a day um, to a year. It's quite interesting exploring the placement module and in particular um, uh, updating our own knowledge um, in light of COVID-19 and for this, this talk today. Um, how much uh, range there is in terms of the time that students are being asked to complete this placement. It's a confusing landscape and it's becoming more confusing as lines between what a student can do um, blur between um, what they can do and what they can do to jeopardise the job of an employee. And I think that's something that we're all very aware of. With the UK government's furlough scheme continuing until October, we've decided that we're not going to run our placements until after that date. And indeed, we're in constant communication with uh, the companies that provide these placements to ensure the, the ethics around um, any timing of uh, a launch or a relaunch of our placement. And transparency in the job market and the inclusion of salaries in the niche and the advert is something else that we've been looking at and considering. And again, it's, it's something that has um, attracted a great deal of attention within the industry itself and um, social media is awash. Um, with discussion and debate around the inequalities that exposes. Um, when we think about uh, placement, we think about the fact that, uh, well, two things, um, when we distill it, um, we consider that it's the student, the first student question that is asked by prospective applicants. It's the most frequently asked question over the last five years of running this particular version of the placement. 
and it raises the most number of questions during induction. And this is no surprise. We know how attractive creative industries are as a career option. And we also know how much emphasis that we as educators put on marketing our placement. And I think that that question of ethics and the responsibility that we have in promoting a placement to students is also something that we should consider uh, very carefully. Um, and sometimes we use the excuse that arguably many companies expect this experience, but I have to say, again, um, we should revisit our responsibility for that um, sometimes quite difficult expectation. When we think about the, the other uh, big question that students uh, want to talk about, and as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's about this networking. It's about um, making these connections with people on a human level. And placements are cited as a key networking tool. Uh, remote working will make these co photocopier chats a thing of the past. So how do we help our students make the network for them? A complication uh, of technology and the lack of it for some students has already been spoken about today, so I'm not going to revisit it now. Um, Adobe have solved this problem, but only in the short term until mid-July. Um, we are finding ourselves in difficult solutions uh, and circumstances to find uh, different solutions. Uh, distance placements are, are uh, options that we've considered. Um, identifying the skills that industry lack, how we can fulfill those um, from a uh, remote location. This turns the concept of the placement on its head. Not only are we not now um, listening to industry, um, but as a vocational program, and we pride ourselves in this, we are promoting and celebrating our connections and our ability to reinvent um, what the placement might mean and what skills industry say they, they, they need. And if we think about this in its broader sense, it's already been mentioned that the university has a wealth of experience and skill set that we can avail ourselves of. Um, we can also consider how we can um, build the experience and the on-site preference um, for the students and, and turn that into something slightly different. And I'm going to rush through this now because I think I've, I'm maybe going over time. But I would want to sort of highlight the fact that what we've, um, what we've decided to do, what we've been doing over the last year, but we're, we're ramping up activity in this regard, is to look at a new place for a placement. And looking at deconstructing the placement and considering um, the placement in the third sector organizations. And it's really interesting to think about um, what has already been talked about today, social responsibility, communities. I really love Karen's um, talk just now on, on our responsibilities um, in that regard. Um, and I think that we could, um, we could, we could really collectively uh, consider what that might mean and how we can to, to um, run the risk of um, being trite and make a difference. And uh, we can sit, could see how some victories have already um, taken place. So we know that zero rating VAT on digital publications from the 1st of May has helped publish, publishers to monetize digital audiences. Uh, we know that key worker oh, status yeah. has been secured Go for ahead. magazine journalists and, and vital yeah. auxiliary yeah. staff, print distribution, etc. Um, but we have a long way to go. A lot of our alumni... Can someone move the mic, please? A lot of our alumni are facing redundancy. As part of the uh, research for this talk today, um, I've, I've spent a great deal of time um, contacting and discuss, discuss, discussing um, and sharing and crying with students um, and alumni who are facing redundancy. Um, so that, that is a real um, problem area and, and something that we, uh, that we have to consider. Universities are divesting themselves of zero hour contracts. Um, that again is presenting challenges to us in terms of guest speakers and the possibilities that those guest speakers bring um, to the placement module. For, for example, we don't have guest speakers coming to our um, talk to our students unless they will um, agree to be involved with our placement module. And this is this kind of interconnected uh, way of working that we have. And we can th think as well, if we look at the third sector, and if we do think about deconstructing the placement, how we can uh, think more globally. What does it mean to say that we are in a place? Uh, we are in Scotland, but there's four corners of the earth. And, and over, the over, the, uh, over the years, we have built up a, a great deal of connections, as I said, with alumni. But we are guilty of, of restricting that. And yet, while restricting it, uh, complaining that the industry is narrow in its focus, um, while we are not actually actively engaging uh, with the industry at large by securing these placements in a digital landscape. 
because, as I said, we are interlinked. We are independent industry, and, and we do have a responsibility there. Um, our, over the years, our students have built up this industry, and many of them are now facing redundancy. And I want to use this opportunity today not only to think about how we can help um, work with the third sector organisations, but is there, are there things that we can do to help our alumni in this difficult situation that they find themselves um, facing redundancy uh, and all the consequences of that. Um, through the course of supporting our current students on this current module, I've also had an eye to the expectations of our new applicants and the responsibilities and challenges and discomfort that places on some of us um, when we think about um, what's happening in, in, in the world around us and, and what we can do as educators to, to make a change. So just really quickly, um, also we can think about um, uh, supplying skills and, and helping students with uh, setting up their own um, magazines and what communities might mean, what communication might mean in this digital environment, what skills they might mean uh, need to be able to um, fulfil those requirements. Um, but just uh, to, to wind up, um, I've deconstructed the placement and as I said, I, 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 um, I found it very useful and enjoyable to, to, to think about the language that we use around placement. And if you could deconstruct the words um, itself, you can see that um, very simply, but importantly, um, it can be seen as cement, binding us to the industry, but also weighing us down. Uh, cement is seldom used on its own, but rather it's used to bind sand and gravel. These aggregates together um, make uh, the most widely used material in existence and is only second to water as the planet's most consumed resource. So again, as I say, we, we need to have a mind um, for what we intend to do with the placement, what it means to us, and a responsibility to not only our current students, our prospective students, but also our, to our alumni. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, Thank you very um, much. For questions. I hope um, I didn't run over time there. Thanks. Thank you. A, li a little bit. I think we can, <laughs> we can make it. Pick it up. That's, that's, a, that's a fascinating, very nuanced account of, of where we are, of, of the interface between our, our programmes and the wider world of, uh, of media and publishing and, and our students and their, and their careers. Thank you. Uh, we could take a couple of minutes maybe for questions, but we are running behind, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, I was going to go two sort of at the same time, actually, because I think Rachel Younger and Becky were, were making a few kind of valid points regarding supporting the alumni. Um, Becky or, or, and or Rachel, do you want to make a point or ask a question at all? Um, I don't know if you can, I, I'm Rachel, I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really an important point what Avril said about, you know, our alumni or in my case, I'm actually a global online lecturer with professional journalists in the classroom. And I was um, tutoring a dissertation this week where a student told me that he's just been made redundant. So half my dissertation tutorial was surrounded uh, uh, with the question, you know, how are you coping? Are you going to cope? Do I need to help you with extenuating circumstances? And um, I do think it's so important um, also what, what Karen said about, um, you know, being before we can become. And I think it's really true that, um, you know, we're, we're not cancers, but at the end of the day, we're really significant people for the people who study with us and we have a strong impact on their lives. But also for alumni who have moved on, I think actually helping them interact with each other and help each other maybe having an alumni community and that's something that we have on Facebook we've got an alumni community where um, alumni interact with each other and help each other with their careers and with tips of where the next job is coming up or how to cope with stuff so maybe putting in place alumni communities is also something in addition to what um, Karen said about putting in place communities of existing students yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Rachel, and, and people have mentioned um, earlier today about the, the resources that the university has and how we um, can use them. But it's, it's true to say, and, and we can acknowledge it here, that um, most of that is, is about marketing and promoting. Um, it's not, not so much as self, about self-care. Um, and, and absolutely have um, a number of um, uh, resources to help students with their mental health, for example, and whether we could, as 
as educators press our institutions to to make those more available to those those students who are maybe um, facing some seriously um, difficult life crises. Okay, well, thank you very much on that. I think we're running a bit tight on time. We could maybe use some of the time at the at the lunch lunch break, uh, but but also uh, Jenny Jenny's coming on Jenny Keane from Leeds Trinity, and I think you're t picking up on the on, on similar similar issues here. So so we can develop the conversation there, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, yes, hopefully I am. Um, so yeah, hello everybody. Um, I am the course leader for our MA Journalism programme at Leeds Trinity, but I'm also the placement coordinator for our level fours. Um, I'm going to just share a bit of our experience of delivering an alternative placement programme to our level fours in lockdown. Um, a couple of bits of context. Um, Leeds Trinity, so placements for Leeds Trinity is something of the USP for us. So every undergraduate student goes through 11 weeks of placements, five weeks at level four, six weeks at level five. Um, and the other thing just to mention is that as a small university, around about three and a half thousand uh, students, we really kind of pride ourselves on the ability to deliver quite individual support and guidance to our students. So um, bearing those two things in mind, um, when lockdown came on the 23rd of March, um, our level four students would have been about to embark on their placement programme kind of six weeks later at the beginning of May. Um, so I was asked to come up with um, a sort of five-week programme because basically nearly all the employers just cancelled the placements. Um, I think in hindsight um, it would have been great to have been able to work a bit more on um, organising remote placements for them. Um, and my colleague Amy Lund, who's with us today, has done a fantastic job on that for our MA students that are, do their placements over the summer. But given these were first years who need an awful lot more support for placement um, and that it was very, very short notice, um, we had to come up with an alternative, basically. Um, so there were sort of two aims to that programme. One was to keep the students engaged throughout those five weeks. And secondly, to try and help develop some of the professional skills that obviously they would have done on placement as well. So um, we came up with um, a five week programme. We had 29 students that we were um, dealing with. Uh, some did manage to, some others did manage to sort out remote uh, working um, but the vast majority were, were doing this program. Um, so the idea was that um, I would deliver one task every week for them to do. Um, so Monday mornings I would um, kind of give the brief in a Panopto recorded um, video. Um, obviously we were available on email throughout the week. We turned around the work that they submitted within a week so they were getting individual feedback every week as well um, and I haven't really got time to go into each of these individually now but um, I think the emphasis really was on trying to make all of these tasks as real as possible um, uh, so that they didn't feel that these were just kind of tick box exercises that we were trying to get them to do so the employer challenge for example we took real employer challenges that had been given to students the previous year for example, Gold.com, an employer in Leeds, um, set uh, a challenge to come up with a coverage plan for the now postponed Euros 21. Um, the coverage analysis was more than just a sort of academic exercise. I tried to sell it to them that, you know, this is something they would be expected to do whenever they go for a job is to really critique um, the coverage that that particular employer um, puts out the output of that particular employer. Um, even the case studies, again, it was meant to be a way of them reaching out to um, people, practitioners in the industry, um, maybe doing audio interviews or, or Zoom video interviews with them, much more than just a kind of academic study really. Um, and certainly one of our students managed to get a couple of interviews with two prominent sports journalists, which has really stood him in good stead. Um, was spotted by Bradford City Football Club and has now been offered work experience um, off the back of that. So um, it was a kind of, 
yeah, a way of getting them to do more than just a sort of um, tick box exercise, really. LinkedIn is not something that we have done previously at level four, but um, seeing the way that the students have really sort of um, picked that up and flown with it, um, I will definitely be bringing that in um, uh, at level four next year. And then trying to get them to pull it all together at the end um, with a personal development plan again, try to sell it to them that this was something that they will all have to do in the industry, in a job. So it's not something they were just doing for a kind of module assessment for university. And the thread running through it all was um, the analytics. We wanted to get them really um, working in practice on trying to create more of a branding for themselves on social media. They'd all written a couple of weeks before, written a series of stories published on their own websites. So um, we kind of focused on Twitter and WordPress analytics. Um, so got them to um, have a starting point at the beginning and then look back on that at the end and see which techniques had worked and which hadn't. Uh, less well and what they needed to do and it was really good to see that um, some of them had actually really clocked um, for example the need to have fresh content on their websites um, and the need to keep posting for example on LinkedIn social media and engaging and had brought that into their plans for the second year so that this was something they were going to do on a weekly basis <coughs> so that was very pleasing. So at the end of the five weeks, 196 pieces of work marked an individual piece, uh, individual feedback given. And this is something I think we haven't really touched on yet. Huge amount of work for tutors who otherwise in a normal year would not particularly have been involved closely during this five week period. <coughs> Sorry. I work with a great team, I'm very lucky, so we really shared this out between us, but it's um, something worth noting. No non-submissions um, and 100% pass rate. Um, and so I do think that first aim of keeping students engaged, we definitely met that at some cost to us, but we did manage to do it. And this compares to a year ago when I think I had six students who either didn't submit or failed their placement element. So, you know, I take that as a really good result, but as I say, at some cost. I tried to do a um, quick survey with the students to get some feedback, but their final marks have only been out this week. Um, so it's been a bit of a quick turnaround, didn't get a great response. Um, but here are some of the comments um, that I did have. So I think, um, again, that second aim of helping to develop some of their professional skills, um, certainly the ones that really engaged and got a lot out, have, have got a lot out of it. And I feel, um, you know, have gone some way towards developing those professional skills that hopefully they would have done on an actual placement. In terms of what I think I've taken from it, um, I really liked what both Franya and Karen were saying about kind of keeping present in their learning and that sense of belonging. Um, I felt that the, the regular contact was really important. I wanted to do this on Zoom so that I could do it live every Monday morning and actually have that face-to-face -face contact with them. Unfortunately, the University for Security Reasons banned us from using Zoom and unfortunately Microsoft Teams which is what we are going to be using uh, was not properly up and running for students by then so that's I was left with basically email Moodle and Panopto um, but I do think you know the importance of the fact that I'd been able to build a relationship with these students over the last year was really important they kind of trusted me um, and that's I think going to be our big challenge for September is we won't have that relationship will we with the uh, the incoming students and it's how to build that really. I think the cell was really important so making them feel that this was actually something that was going to help them and be beneficial to them it wasn't just as I say a tick box exercise. On the questionnaire they did say email and Moodle were very useful, Panopto less so, so yeah all those efforts I made to get up and ready on Monday morning, get myself presentable to do my panopto. Who knows how useful it was? I have looked at some of the stats. I think the highest um, 
uh, engagement I had was um, 38 unique viewers for uh, one of the Pinoptos. Um, the lowest was 11. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear other people's that that idea earlier from Alejandro about the recorded versus live aspect. But I think the biggest thing for me is that I feel from all of this, we've kind of banked some goodwill from these students for them going into the second year where obviously they're going to be doing a lot more of this online delivery. Um, uh, this was two unsolicited comments I had from students. So I feel like um, it was worth doing, you know, partly just to build that sense of goodwill going forward. That's it. Jenny, thank you very much. I think one of the things that I'm getting from a lot of these, uh, from all the presentations so far, is, is, is that sense of passing, con passing ownership and control to the students and how they're rising to the challenge really, really well in many cases. Thank you. Steve, would you like to uh, pick up on questions? Yeah, I'd have a couple of questions actually. I, I think one of the things that kind of people have done brilliantly actually, and we all need to kind of appreciate, is how much stress there is involved in kind of moving from uh, uh, ordinary teaching to, to online and that those weeks during in March were, were, were very tough for many people and kind yeah. of mentally very challenging. I was just wondering Jenny do, do you have any kind of sort of kind of tips for dealing with any of that and how do you think you know your, your colleagues did? Um, well I think um, you know, the technology was a challenge. So we were, we just all adapted to Zoom. We'd kind of got up and running with Zoom and then the rug was totally pulled from under our feet and we had to completely switch direction. So, you know, there was an awful lot of frustrations, an awful lot of challenges. Um, I think just sort of um, being there for each other and supporting each other um, was was the main thing that got us through really i think um yeah team working um but i do think it has been at quite some personal cost really great great and well, was there any kind of because students uh you have been disappointed by losing fee using losing work placements um mm -hmm. did you get any pushback regarding the work you're doing from students well um, I think that was sort of what surprised me by the level of engagement, really, that um, they all did this and they all, um, actually a lot of them did really, really well. Um, I did have one comment on the questionnaire basically saying this was a waste of time and, you know, we should have just scrapped the whole idea once we couldn't do a placement. Um, but I think on the whole, um, they did tend to see um, the... The value in doing some of these exercises and certainly from the um, activity that I've seen from a lot of them on LinkedIn since I can really see a difference in mm. in how they're performing basically and how they're getting themselves out there. Yeah absolutely you know I think it is it is a very difficult situation did can I because I think a couple of people are asking this actually did any of your students get work placements before kind of lockdown kicked in and you converted to this alternative assignment or or well, they they pretty much all will have had work placements set up um we're, we're very lucky at least trinity to have a placements office that works with us purely on helping that happen make that happen so yeah the almost all of them will have been set up with a work placement but the vast majority of the employers just cancelled them. Um, and I do think, you know, given that these were first years and take a lot more supporting, um, but I think we had five or six who maybe even a bit more who did actually manage to um, negotiate doing remote working for those placements. So some of them did go ahead. Um, but yeah, it was kind of out of our hands really. Um, in that it was it came from the placement house sure and um, finally um uh, claire claire wolf would you like to um drop into this oh hello yes um great presentation we, we had a similar um thing running at worcester but it was just print there were students who were due to go on newspaper magazine placements 
and um, absolutely the colleague who led this, uh, Christine Challenge, you know, was having to run morning news conferences um, and support them with, you know, doing rewrites and going back yeah. out to get stuff. And, you know, I think it's another example with this COVID-19 of the extra workload we've all had to cope with, with students, you know, being very kind of um, needy online, shall we say, and particularly with, with that placement. I think next year, I mean, probably like you, we're looking to see, well, you know, I know the BBC aren't going to be doing any placements until the spring and you know we've got to look seriously at how we manage next year have you thought around that workload and got any strategies for dealing with that with management or to reduce it or anything because it's actually could i put it on this we're, we're very tight on time we're running over here and i'm conscious that that point you've raised claire actually maps really well onto the issues uh, I think Sally Ann Duncan from Susclyde Sus and Anne Luce from Bournemouth are going to be picking up on on issues to do with mental health um, and the students and the toolkit that they put together for that. Could I move on to them and then come back in, uh, after one o'clock to a, uh, um, a a wider discussion on the on the issues that, that have come up for those who want to want to stay on for that. Thanks, so, Sally Ann and. OK, thanks, David. Thanks, everybody, for staying on to the end to hear Anne and I's talk. Um, we're not going to use any slides today. We're just going to, to um, deliver a talk to you. Um, and as well as what David has mentioned, we're actually going to look at the emotional involvement um, of our students in the story. Um, and I know Karen mentioned some of these things, but I think we're going to be taking a much more pragmatic view about how do we actually deal with these things um, with our students who are having to cover um, the various stories. So um, we're going to look at um, how we teach our students how to deal with these difficult stories. Um, so how do we prepare them, especially when um, they're going to be dealing with uh, issues around trauma and death? Um, and they'll be doing most of that online or remotely from us. So I'm going to say a few words about covering trauma generally. Um, and then Anne will talk about um, reporting suicide specifically. For example, um, what should journalism educators do to prepare our students? Um, and she'll explain more about that later when she, when she talks. Um, so we know that it's likely that our students uh, are going to be wanting to cover the two biggest stories that are happening at the moment and are likely to be with us for some time, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. Um, because we will still be asking them to report stories. We can't get away from that as, as journalism educators. But both these stories involve trauma because they focus on deaths, fears, threats, mental health issues, safety, anxiety, broken systems, angry people, injustice and potential suicides. Um, but it's worth remembering uh, that our students are traumatised too, or could be traumatised. Um, we don't know what they've experienced in lockdown. Some, they might have told us, some might have, have um, been in touch with us about these issues, but mostly they will have kept this to themselves. So they're going to be traumatised or likely to have been traumatised, and they'll continue to have these experiences. So being traumatised and reporting and trauma is not a good combination. So we need to be there to support our students through these issues. Um, so we may need to find ways to prepare them to report these sorts of stories, even if they're only um, doing so tangentially and not actually doing the death knock. Um, we need to think about how we can uh, support them. And we need to build in support in our online teaching, whether it's through um, forums or chats or links to useful content or one-to-one -one Zoom meetings where we um, brief prior to the interview, if that's what they're doing, and after the, the story has been completed. So with that in mind, um, what do we tell our students about reporting sensitive stories? And indeed, should we actually be encouraging them to do these sorts of stories? 
And I would say yes, and I know Anne would support me in this, um, because if we don't enable them to do these sorts of stories just now in a safe environment, then when are they going to get the opportunity? Are they going to do what I had to do, which was basically learn by doing it? Um, I don't think so. I don't think that's a good way forward. I think we should be there um, allowing them to engage with these topics, deal with the human aspect of it, um, and then um, giving them that necessary support through uh, unpicking the experience with them. Um, so what I'm going to tell you um, is some advice, um, and this, most of this advice is based on my research on um, reporting death and bereavement, which is my specific research area. Um, but also uh, some of it is from my work with Anne on reporting suicide. Um, and Anne's a, a specialist in reporting suicide in, in media. Um, so firstly, I would say to you, we've all had to do these sorts of stories if we've been working journalists. So um, much as uh, our own experiences can be valuable and anecdotes are a great way of um, building rapport with students, um, enabling us to uh, teach them about practice and such like, I would advise don't tell them your war stories. Um, keep your horror stories to yourselves because when you were working as uh, young reporters or indeed more experienced reporters, um, you were working in a different environment, a different time. Um, and these types of stories scare students um, and they're not really relevant to their working days, their, their world today. Instead, um, try to work with them, meet them on a level and try to talk through their ideas with them. Ask them open questions about it, about what they're planning to do and gently um, unpick what they're doing so that you build, still build their confidence um, that they have ideas that are worthwhile, um, but you need to encourage them, but be realistic about what they can actually achieve, achieve especially if they're doing this from their bedrooms. Um, but also ask them to think about safety and risk. And I realise that if they are doing this from home, they won't have the same environmental and physical risks that they might encounter if they were doing it in the field. Um, but they are doing it in isolation and they don't have colleagues. It's not like they can bump into somebody in the newsroom and say, how do you think I should deal with this situation? Um, so, you know, they're by themselves. So they, you need to be aware about that. Get them to think about that risk. Um, most likely they'll, they will gather and write these stories remotely, as I've said. Um, so it brings its own problems. Um, if they're interviewing someone who has been traumatized, either by the loss of a loved one, either through COVID or suicide or um, uh, you know, injury or death in a riot, um, it can be difficult to build rapport and empathy. And empathy is really important in, in um, traumatic reporting. Um, so it's difficult for them to do that over Zoom or other technologies. So the technology can actually get in the way of um, the story gathering and the reporting. So make them aware of that. and try to think with them as to how they can over the, overcome that particular problem. Um, they might just want to grab something off social media. You know, there, there probably will be some tweets or posts that they can use, um, but try to discourage that fr from them doing that because uh, one, um, the families involved don't like that because they have no input to the story um, and the, the posts are being used um, for other purposes than their intended personal public purpose, even if they were in a public environment. So try to talk them into doing something bigger and better and more worthy. So when they're actually thinking about the reporting, um, things that you could encourage them to do is tell them to be honest with their sources about the purpose of their story. What, what, why are they interviewing this person and what are they aiming to get out of it? Um, that helps the students to think through what they're actually having to do, but it also reassures their interviewees. Um, students are usually fearful of upsetting their interviewees if uh, the interviewees are traumatised. 
Um, upsetting the interviewee um, is unlikely to come from just contacting them and asking them a series of questions about their situation if it's done in a sensitive manner. It's insensitive reporting that upsets them. It's inaccuracies like getting the name wrong, the age, the circumstances of, of um, a person's death. Um, these are all the upsetting factors. Um, speaking to a young reporter or a young reporter contacting a family to ask for an interview is not upsetting in itself. Um, advise them to acknowledge their interviewee's grief or trauma. Um, in other words, get this, or encourage the students to say that they are sorry for someone's loss, but they must be sincere. It can't just be words. Um, but also remind the students that life is not normal. Um, remind them that loved ones have died alone, um, that families have been restricted to uh, numbers uh, who can attend a funeral, and relatives and friends have not been able to hug each other. Um, so when they're dealing with a, an interview, a sensitive interview, particularly over Zoom or, or even on the phone, they need to be aware of, of the, the, the sort of vulnerability around um, the people that they're interviewing and those circumstances. And one thing that we found useful is almost to try to get the students to walk in the shoes of the person that they're dealing with. They might not have any experience of bereavement, but they might be able to empathise a little bit more. Um, ask the students when they're setting up their interviews with the uh, traumatised people to explain the reporting process if they're acting as a journalist or if they're doing this as a student journalist, then explain the ass assessment process. Why are they doing this story? Is it an assignment um, as part of a news day or is it a, an assessment in which um, other people will read this and will assess them on that basis? So um, explain the purpose and, and who is going to see this? How far does it go beyond um, the classroom? Um, is it going to be published? That kind of thing. Um, remind them that they are writing about people um, I had a, um, a tutor at Cardiff University who said, people make news. I've never, ever forgotten that. Um, so they're writing about people, not data, not statistics, not figures. These things can be part of the story. But if they're doing this sort of uh, human interest type story, then obviously it's the people that are important in the story. However, if they're doing a data story based on data journalism or statistics, then and that there uh, is less of an, a human element, then of course the data leads the story. Um, they should also leave their interviewee with links of helplines or support. So um, at the end of the interview, they should be saying, if someone's been bereaved, um, perhaps you could get in touch with crews, or if it's um, around a suicide, then um, perhaps Samaritans would be uh, a useful thing to see. And these helplines should be included in the story as well for other vulnerable people. So after they've done the reporting, um, reassure them about what they've done and the experience that they've had. Tell them that they will make mistakes with this type of reporting um, and enable them, almost empower them to accept at times that they will get it wrong because that's quite a fear amongst students who are doing this kind of, of story, that they will get it wrong and therefore upset those who are in their stories. Um, so it's, it's not so much that they're going to get it wrong. It, the important factor is how do they fix it um, and how do they fix it quickly. Um, also advise them to phone their interviewee after the interview as a courtesy just to say thank you for the interview and for um, speaking to me about such a sensitive topic. And also just to check that they're okay. Um, because many journalists, experienced journalists um, working in all different platforms, sometimes forget in the, the urgency to get the story that actually they need to make sure that, those, that the people that have been interviewing um, about a trauma, about a vulnerability, are, are, are fine, that they're okay. 
Um, and also lastly, tell the students to look after themselves. Um, their own mental health is important. They need to be aware of their own well-being. Um, encourage them to find something that uh, helps them to de-stress about this type of story, whether it's going for a walk or talking to their best friend or um, you know, just having a cup of tea, um, whatever. But you know, get them to find something that is going to help them to de-stress. And also, I would thoroughly recommend that if you have students who are going to do this kind of work, that you individually debrief them. So you go through what they have um, experienced, talk it through. You don't even have to offer advice. Often just listening is important. Um, but they need to feel that they're getting some sort of reassurance um, after they've completed this kind of work. Um, you'll find much more about all this sort of work in our books um, plug. Um, I've written a book with Jackie Newton from Liverpool, John Moores, on reporting bad news. Um, and Anne has written a book on ethical reporting of sensitive topics. And these are both available as e-books, so um, students can ask, access them remotely if you want. Um, I can also recommend a couple of articles that you could find useful. Um, there was a very good art article by the Pointner um, Institute the other week there on um, the source and, and the student journalist. And this was written specifically from the point of view of um, journalists who are working on university newspapers in America and how journalism lecturers should be supporting them in um, covering these difficult stories. And the other one is a, um, a, a story on the BBC Academy website um, on useful tips for reporting COVID-19 stories. And this has been written by Joe Healy at the BBC. And I think I'd asked Margaret to circulate that previously. Mm -hmm. um, and if you find Joe's work useful um, in that regard, then she's got an excellent book out uh, also um, on trauma reporting, a journalist's guide to covering sensitive stories. Um, and it's very practical full of great advice and I would thoroughly recommend you add that to your reading lists for students. Um, I'll now hand over to Anne um, and she's going to talk about our suicide toolkit and um, how to report suicide stories. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm conscious of time uh, and we're all hungry and need a loo break, at least I do. So I'm going to kind of run through this. Um, so just to provide some context in terms of why we need to get our students thinking about suicide reporting um, and why we as journalism educators need to think about teaching it. Um, what we know from previous pandemics and epidemics is that suicide rates have increased, uh, but it's not inevitable. So it hasn't happened in every case. From the current pandemic, we actually know that suicide attempts have, have increased across the UK since mid-March. The Office for National Statistics released data just yesterday that shows while anxiety and happiness rates have started to rebound since lockdown, um, assessment of life satisfaction has actually, so that feeling that what we do in life is worthwhile, that's what the life satisfaction um, data is, that has actually declined and it's actually gotten worse. Um, it's at its lowest levels even since before the pandemic. And what we know from the life satisfaction is that the groups we're most concerned with are those who have health problems and those who have mental health conditions. So we know that li low life satisfaction is a significant risk for suicide. We know from a report that was released last week that nurses aged 45 to 54 are at a higher risk of suicide um, than they've ever been. Um, and we also know from a report released two weeks ago that 600 young people a year are dying by suicide, 74% of which are happening in the age 17 to 19 age group, so our student age group. Um, this was on the rise pre-pandemic, uh, especially in young females. Um, but the concern now is that this is going to continue to rise uh, through the pandemic. 
we know that in that 17 to 19 age group, there are five specific risk factors. Witnessing domestic violence, which we know uh, has had an increase since the lockdown. Second one's bullying. Third one is self-harm, which we know has increased since the lockdown. Bereavement is the fourth one. And we know obviously COVID-19 bereavement plus exposure to previous suicide bereavement. And the fifth risk factor is academic pressures. So we need to be preparing our students to report on suicide um, responsibly and ethically because there's a strong chance, many of us here probably have gone throughout our enti entire journalistic careers having never covered a suicide, but in this particular moment in time, um, in the world that we're currently living in, there is a very strong chance that our students may have to report on suicide um, once they graduate or they will be affected by suicide themselves in some way. And just for context, Sally Ann and I completed a study back in 2018 where we talked to journalism students around the UK and Ireland about suicide. And 60% of the students in that, in that or 60% of the respondents said that they had been affected by suicide. They knew someone who had died by suicide. And 20% said, that they had been a, they had lost someone very close to them which was a family member we also know from our research that we've done that journalism educators are reticent to teach suicide um, because it's uncomfortable or there's a fear amongst us that you know if we talk about it then we may cause someone to take their own life um, some of us don't know how to broach the topic and and others are thinking the curriculum's packed enough already. How else do I fit this in? Now, those are just a few of the reasons that we've come across over the years. So what we've done is Sally Ann and I have created the Responsible Suicide Reporting Model, where we embed ethical reporting and media reporting guidelines on suicide. So from IPSO, Ofcom, Samaritans, World Health Organization, Society of Professional Journalists in the US, for instance, we've embedded all the media reporting guidelines into the storytelling process so that journalism students and journalists can be confident in their practice when they're reporting on suicide. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick and show you what the model looks like. So we're asking students to identify the different type of suicide story that they're reporting on. We then ask them to apply some ethical rules and then we've created a standard of moderation. Um, and this is where those guidelines, suicide reporting guidelines have been embedded. So this is what it looks like. It's a three-step process in terms of teaching. So what we've actually done is we've created the suicide reporting toolkit for journalists and for journalism educators, which will be launching on Monday, the 6th of July. So you can put that in your diary. Um, and what we've done is we've created lesson plans. We've provided guidance on how to teach our model. Um, and we've provided a load of additional resources that you can engage with depending on where you are within your teaching practice. Because the model is embedded in storytelling, you can actually teach it in units and modules on news, features, magazine journalism, mobile journalism, data journalism, podcasting, audio, video, sports journalism. You can use some of the examples in news days or as breaking news scenarios. You can teach the model in theoretical classes. So you could teach it in ethics, public affairs, law, news theory, for instance. All the lesson plans are bite-sized, so you can take a lesson and weave it into a larger class, or you can pull several together and put together a one or a two hour session. Now on the site, we also have information on self-care. Um, so how do we teach our students to protect themselves when reporting and when they've stopped reporting like Sally Ann said earlier? And we also have some guidance for you as educators on how you can frame a session. So how do you broach the topic? How do you support students who might be affected by suicide in your classroom? Um, and perhaps they don't even want to stay in the class. They don't want to participate. Um, so really, it's covering off the ethics and safety of teaching 
such a sensitive topic in your classroom. So we've provided guidance on that as well. We also talk about the nuts and bolts. So how to use uh, social media uh, responsibly and ethically, how to create info boxes, sidebars, the use of infographics, use of statistics, use of video and audio, and how that all comes into the reporting of suicide. We're also going to be adding to the toolkit. So if you are doing amazing stuff already around, you know, the topic of suicide and you are covering it and teaching it in a particular way, please do send it along to either myself or Sally Ann because we're looking to build like a, a place of best practice on suicide reporting because this is a massive gap outside, you know, Australia, the rest of the world doesn't really have a strong support system for journalism educators in terms of how we can be teaching this subject. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but if there are any questions, happy to answer. Um, sorry, Anne, thank you very much. Um, I, I think one question is, um, where will we access the toolkit? Yes, so what we're going to get... Thank you for that. I'm not going to give you the link because it's still under construction at the moment. Uh, we're on a very tight deadline, um, but we will be sending out uh, the link via Mexa, AJE. It's going out to, we've partnered up with all the major media organizations and obviously we will be sending it out to all of our friends and family and then we'll be asking people to disseminate as well. So we do have a dissemination strategy plan. Um, so I'm sure it will come to your inbox at some point. And I think we'll probably ask Margaret and yourself, David, if you could perhaps put something on the AGE website for us as well. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we have run over time catastrophically, but that's not a problem. <laughs> I think uh, unless people are desperate to go to the toilet and desperate to uh, get something, get something to eat. So a, a what, what I'm happy to do is carry on the conversation and questions and such like for the next, uh, um, until, until quarter to two, when I've got to make sure that a link for the afternoon session works, because that's just to remind people, this won't roll over after two o'clock. There's a separate session with a login for that. Uh, you have to click on the link for that. Um, that was just in case the bulb went on this one, it wouldn't go on all of them. I will so, save the chat as well, David. I'll say again? I'll save the chat as well now. Um, Great. So it doesn't vanish. Thank you very, thank you very much, Steve. That's terrific. So uh, those of you who need to rush to the loo, those of you who need to go and grab something to eat, feel free to take your leave. Uh, those of you who wish to stay on and chat, please welcome to do so. I'll st I'll stop on till quarter two. Steve, do you want to pick up on some of the questions that, have co co that came up in Sally Anzalan's session? Sorry, um, I'm not, I'm, I've, I've unmuted myself now. I don't know if, if Karen, are you around? Actually, I don't know if you want to ask. Um, you mentioned the Dart Centre. Yeah, I'm here. I was just um, just that a colleague um, on the chat mentioned that the Dart Centre also has great resources, loads of resources being shared in the chat, um, and just that yeah, we've been training with the Dart Centre for quite a few years at Bournemouth, training all our students in. Um, in trauma and covering traumatic news events so we managed to fit the sessions in just before lockdown this year but I think really interesting points raised in both talks about you know how different things are when we're in virtual spaces which is the theme of, of today's mm. conference isn't yeah. it but I, I think you know that thinking about these things when you're removed from people and you can't do the normal face-to-face -face is really important so Thanks to Sally Ann and Anne for that. Absolutely. I don't know who the Dart Centre are. I don't know if there are other people I don't know. Um, they are there. I've put the link to their resources in the chat and they are um, a charity which um, is actually set up. It's called the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma. It's based in Columbia University. It's come out of Columbia University, but there is a European arm as well. And they, they have great resources. Um, for everything on their on their website really great resources for covering all, any number of traumatic news events so i would urge people to, to look at it if they don't know it mm, we, no, we don't. work quite closely with um dar center asia pacific as well kate mcmahon out there um you know the, the stuff they're doing in australia um around trauma and you know suicide reporting is pretty epic so they've got loads of resources as well um you know in addition to the guys in europe and colombia i mean they make a fabulous trio <laughs> yeah it's all i mean it's all online isn't it so yeah, you yeah. can go yeah. into whichever whichever space you want to go to once yeah. you're there but so it's, it's a very great great resource for all of us so. for sure
Sure. Once we get the toolkit up and running, I think you'll we have a section there on resources. So there will be a lot of links to all these different um, groups throughout the world. Um, because another thing we have to remember is that not all our students are going to come from the UK. Um, so they, you know, they could, they could be in their home country um, and not be able to access the resources or they're not relevant to them. So we've tried to put a, a, a number of different worldwide sources onto the um, toolkit as well. Yeah, it's amazing how many different codes of ethics there are when it comes to how you actually report on suicide. So it's uh, interesting. It's up, one of the one of the dark um, uh, centres resources that I use on on a program here in Newcastle is uh, a book they brought out some time ago now on reporting reporting violence um, and reporting trauma. And and one of the, one of the really important things that I take from that is, is not just when, when, when the, the moment happens and, and you're reporting at a, tra at, at a recent trauma or something that's been happening in, in terms of news, but the anniversary bit. When you're going to someone, uh, it might be a family, and saying this is the anniversary or something awful that's happened to you, or you go into a community, uh, Dunfermline, Appapan, whatever, to say some older one, and, and, and saying this is the anniversary of something that, that awful has happened to you. And, and there are so many ways of getting that wrong and I think that there's very helpful guidance there about how to approach those things and to consider you know do you approach them and there's also the occasion when something awful happens in a, in a, in a community it might be a, a shooting or a killing a mass killing or a mass shooting or multiple mm -hmm. killings like that and then the reporter goes to somewhere where it's happened before and says are you thinking about these people at the time do you want to send them mm -hmm. your your thoughts and, and again it's those those are really Things that, that, that are taken as, oh, yes, you go and do it, but they're, they're, they need thinking about and they yeah. need a lot, lot of thoughts. In the um, ethical reporting of sensitive topics edited collection I pulled together, um, Glenn Greensmith from uh, Curtin University in Australia, um, he's doing amazing work around mass shootings. Um, he's kind of really, to be honest, he's kind of the only person who's doing it from a media journalism perspective. Um, and, you know, he used to be a journalist in the UK and is now, you know, he was out in Australia during the Port Charles, um, they call it massacre. Um, but, you know, he's done quite a bit of work um, around mass shootings. Yeah. So if you're looking for something, you know, in terms of how would you do that? Um, he kind of set lays out a step by step guide on how we can teach students how to cover some of these, you know, more challenging subjects for sure. It's also, I think, important to pick up on that point you were making, David, about the anniversary story. Um, that, that was one of the stories that I um, identified when I um, devised a typology of trauma stories. Um, and having looked at um, a, a large sample of um, stories around uh, the death knock. Um, and what I found when I looked at the anniversary stories was that they were almost like a tribute story all over again. Um, in that they were dealing with the facts of the case like the, or the situation again. So they, they, were, they had a high potential for re-traumatisation um, because it was going over that old ground and some of that old ground was um, situations where there was a, it was unresolved. So it could be a, a murder that had never been solved, for example, um, or even you know, if, if there had been a murder where there had been a court case merely going back over that ground again was enough to, to really um, sensitise the, the, the families, the interviewees um, to the situation and it could actually do a lot of damage. So it needs a lot of careful handling. Um, it's not just a question of for the reporter revisiting the, those same old questions again. They would actually have to think quite seriously about what they're doing. Yeah. Steve, is anything else coming up on the chat or would anyone else like to um, comment on what we've been talking yeah, about? Yeah, do, do feel for anyone wanting to kind of jump in. I'm just, you know, moving away from from the reporting of trauma. I'm really interested in in the fact that our students are, many of them have been traumatised by the situation they're in. And I don't know if other people have seen this. When you see kind of really how students live when you're doing a video a video class with them some of these halls of residence are really really small the rooms are tiny and you think you know that 
this must be very, very difficult for some of our students, actually. I just think, you know, I think you know, um, it's really, you know, that's really just a observation. I forgot how small these, these rooms were. And um, they must be, during the lockdown, they must be craving trying to get out and, you know. <laughs> I think also it's, it's um, you know, the people who are still in the halls tend to be the students that are really far from home. Mm. Um, so they're isolated in, in different ways. I, I have a dissertation student at the moment, master's dissertation from China, student from China. And, you know, she's, she just wants to talk. She doesn't want to talk about her dissertation. She just wants to talk to me um, because it's another face. It's a friendly voice. Um, and, you know, I really feel for them because they are stuck in that little room miles and miles away from home. Mm. I, I've got this theory, and I don't know what other people think, that, um, um, you know, that obviously I'm involved in the MA multimedia at Westminster. Um, students just going, aren't going to accept 100% online teaching, I don't think. I, I think, you know, they're desperate to get out of their bedrooms now. Mm. That's just my theory, but... I'm desperate to get out of mine as well. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say in Scotland, we're still not out yet. You guys are a bit more out than us. But um, I was going to say my worry is that there's going to be a financial crisis that's going to be quite significant off the back of this. So first, we've had all the deaths and the pandemic and, 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 and the being locked in. But the problem is that I think that actually the economy might not recover for years to come. And there's going to be this slow moving depression where people can't get jobs and mm. students don't see a prospect. I mean, you know, in the rolling, you know, 1990s, people just were paid money to go and start a new job, graduate job. And now I think people are facing, you know, if the pubs are open, having to work in pubs because they can't get jobs. So I think for us, um, this is going to last much longer that we're going to have to support our or help our students have ways to 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 to, to um, not just be confident emotionally, but to digest the situation because the world is going to change. I might be wrong and I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> but unfortunately I think, you know, if you look at the 1929 uh, global economic crash, um, it took a whole year for the um, unemployment rates to rise to where they were, the stuff we talk about today. So it wasn't 1929, it was 1930. And so this, this is slow moving and it was the same in 2007, 8, 9. It was slow and it had a long impact in the UK, longer than elsewhere in the world, I guess. So, so yeah, we need to brace ourselves for helping students to, to frame what is going to be a big global story and a big story for the UK, I think, mm. and, and a big story that's going to impact them personally. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think as well, the other thing is about their own profile as journalists, if they do decide to go into journalism, which as we know, many of them don't, mm. when they're training as journalists, you know, you've got on the one hand, journalists as key workers, mm. so they feel really sort of validated. But then there's quite a lot out there on social media, which we found, you know, some of our community reporters and the Facebook guys have been dealing with where they are, you know, vilified as uh, for working as journalists or working within communities and seen as perhaps invading privacy and, and all the other other sorts of things that we've, we've seen levelled at journalists. Um, so I think there's a real challenge for them there in terms of professional identity as well, regardless of the sort of bombed out landscape in terms of the economy. Um, so it's really difficult for them to sort of position themselves within their profession as well at the moment, mm. find anchors yeah. for that. I yeah. think we're really going to be dealing with that in the next sort yeah. of phase of our teaching this coming year. It's going to be more about that than living in lockdown, which might look relatively straightforward in comparison, I, mm. I fear. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Are people? Um, I, I don't know if people are willing to share their kind of their university's plans, but uh, you know, what what are what are people kind of doing? Uh, is anyone here going purely online only? But, um, yeah, at Napier we're basically. Uh, oh, Avril, do you want to say Avril? No, say no, no I, I was simply just putting my hand up because it was just simpler just to say <laughs> yes, we're going online. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but basically at Napier, we're basically, you know, there are some things like, you know, TV studios where we're going to try and do live rolling news days in the studios with dramatically reduced student numbers. But we're kind of like doing all the theory and anything we possibly can is going to go online, which is, uh, which is, it's difficult. But basically in Scotland, people are far more careful about the virus and they think that um, it's, there's going to be a second wave and there's going to be another lockdown. 
So the university is getting ready for it. And I think it's not just the students, it's also the staff because the staff are having to put their whole teaching online without extra time allocation. Mm -hmm. And, and whilst we, we want to be compassionate with students and we are compassionate with students and we want to do a brilliant job and give them a multimedia flashing experience and, and also the compassion they need, but at the same time, it's, it's a lot of extra uh, that's required of us and we're going to have to find that resilience ourselves to be there for them. Um, Could I just add something um, that, uh, as they say, whilst we've been on air, there have been two developments which I think might change things. Um, the Hancocks announced that in England, anyway, was the, the, the level has gone down from four to three. And linked to that, I think the government's about to announce, or within the next day or two, that social distancing will go down from two metres to one. Now, that would make a huge difference to our planning. We've been struggling to work out literally our building we have our corridors are too narrow for social distancing and we've really been battling with that also um, our estates people tell us that with a two meter distancing which is just talking about academic subjects our capacity would be down to 17 percent in terms of class space mm. but with one meter distancing it would be 70 percent that's a huge difference yeah. both I mean, I won't uh, remote, I wouldn't dare suggest that the government's uh, moving fast because of their complete cock up with getting people back to school. But I do think that whereas 24 hours ago, and I was in planning meetings where we just couldn't plan, frankly, I think we might not be in lockdown come September, in which all of these really difficult measures, particularly for practice teaching, might be somewhat easier. But I could be wrong. Mm. Say that to Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Can I just leap in. Sorry, it's been wonderful. I've been listening in the background. Uh, you'll notice it's Andrew David Siren Radio at the University of Lincoln. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not properly one of you guys. Um, but I was interested in you talking about work experience and, and preparing your students for the new whatever it's going to be. I'm not going to use the, the new normal because I hate that expression. Although, oops, I've just used it. Um, I'm part of the community radio network and there are now 300 stations across the UK. Uh, there's a small managers group that gets together every week and last week one of the managers said he's noticed a huge uptake in volunteering from students at a nearby university. Now a lot of the community radio stations unlike Siren don't have a dedicated news team. They just take a two minute IRN top of the hour bulletin. But one of the things you might want to encourage them to do because they're now working so well in this technological online, being able to submit things online, to suggest to their community radio stations, if they're not doing it, would they like some input of some level of uh, community news, which they can do in a range of ways, whether it's just simply recording something and sending it to them, or being a little bit more imaginative. And I'm sure if, well, once they've got over the fact that it's a young person coming into community radio, which tends to be more senior people in, the, in, in, in our social settings, um, they might be really excited about getting some enriching content to their output because they're struggling as well with keeping things going. I just throw my six pennies in for what it's worth. Thanks. Andrew, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I know, I know we, we at Newcastle are, are planning to be able, be able to deliver all our teaching and learning outcomes online. There might be another lockdown, there might be another spike or something like that. Um, but we, we're, we're, we're planning to, we're look, looking at ways in which we can enrich the experience of being on campus and being around about. And one of, the, one of those ways is to work with all the organisations we do at the moment. So we've, we've got Radio Tyneside, which is a hospital radio piped to hospitals, but it's also a community radio broadcast around based on issues of health and well-being. And they're, they're looking for mini documentaries and such like, which is excellent. We've got Spice FM, which works in the west end of the city and sort of very diverse communities there. Um, and our students have, have, have worked with those. So, so ways in which we can improve and enrich the campus experience is, uh, is, is, is a big focus at the moment. That, but the teaching delivery is, is all going to be capable of being done online. Anybody else coming in on that one? Or another well, topic, something from this morning. Well, I, I could uh, just talk a little bit about because um, I mentioned the third sector. So, um, um, in, when I was when I was in my talk, and we've we've done a lot of work with um, third sector 
organisations. And it's really interesting you mentioned radio stations. Um, what we've been doing, because we're, we're publishing and working with well, that way, that way, that, that way, Rachel <laughs> um, on my oh, screen. Yeah. Um, hi, yeah. I'm working with Rachel so that we can, um, <laughs> up way, down way, um, so that we can uh, collaborate and, and have this, uh, these synergies that we know that exist between publishing and, and, and journalism. In fact, you know, I spend all my time talking to people, what's the difference? How are you different from a journalist, you know, a publisher? But now we're just embracing those differences and saying, okay, well, you know, Rachel and I have been talking a lot about the kind of um, uh, teaching that she delivers to her students and how we can use it with, with what we do in publishing. Because what we do in publishing is we encourage our students to um, publish magazines. And as I mentioned that, so talking to them about how they can reach out to enormous variety and number of community organizations that publish their own little in-house magazine, mm -hmm. um, their newsletter, you know, the bulletin, all of these kind of things um, that, that it just allows that student also to make a connection. Um, and, and we were talking a bit about uh, people in the human level and, and considering um, the story that revolves around the person, if that's going to be a problem. And, and, and certainly it's not my area of expertise at all. Um, the mental health of those individuals is something that, as, as you mentioned, Rachel, is going to be something that we're going to have to um, be aware of and, and think about how we can help with and making those connections with other um, community organizations, some of which are more vulnerable than the students themselves, can help to drive that empathy, I think. I think the, it's, it's emerged a few times this, 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 this morning, that, that, that notion of empathy in, in lots of different contexts and, and uh, different areas. I think it's critically important. I was invited to speak a while ago on uh, Radio Newcastle um, about the son doing a story about a uh, cricketer's family who'd gone through a trauma before he was born, but in New Zealand, uh, when they were, their mother was married to someone else. And I hadn't actually come across the story at the time, so I didn't, <laughs> didn't I? it dawned on me later what they were talking about when I saw the, saw the thing. But that struck me as, 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 as uh, underlined how, just how important empathy is in how we work as journalists. And in many ways, that's... that's you know, in my experience in journalism, that was that was often stripped out. Uh, empathy wasn't the issue. It was it was getting that headline. It was getting that story. It was getting the uh, uh, the, pra the praise of your peers, um, um, rather than uh, issues to do with actually who we're doing the job for. I think that, that's that's something which is which has built on me over the years. I think it's it's it's, it's built on how we teach journalism over the years. Um, it's, it's very much more central, I think. I think that's a, good, a fair comment, David. I, I think what we'll probably find is that um, empathy uh, is going to appear in much more different types of storytelling. It's, it's not just going to be the human interest story or, or stories around trauma and um, death. I think it's going to be uh, in other stories that people um, are reporting business stories, you know, specialist stories, sports, etc. Because um, I have a, a feeling and I have nothing more than that to base it on that um, empathy is actually re starting to replace impartiality to a certain extent. Um, I mean, I see it in my own students' work where they, they tend to be um, building much more emotionality into their stories, even if it's, it's just a straightforward news story. Uh, than than would be acceptable when you know we were reporting, um, and the, where your the journalist's um, reaction to certain things was not to to be brought into the story at all. So I think that's changing, and we are going, moving more towards compassion, empathy, um, and no bad thing in my view, as long as we can still keep that balance to a certain extent. I, I agree with you that it's the same. I, I feel this is a, a new generation and this generation naturally tends to be more um, focused on emotions and being open about emotions and expressing empathy. So it comes with their, basically their youth culture that this is part of who they are. So, which is, we can welcome this, right? This is good.
Well, I think perhaps we've reached the end of uh, of the we conversation. Have to be clear, don't we now? Because the session is coming to a close. <laughs> Are you saving the recording? I think we're still recording, which is a wonderful thing, but <laughs> maybe we should... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. About you. It's been fantastic. Thanks to everybody. It's been absolutely great. Yeah. It's been very good. Thank you. Can I just thank David and Steve for chairing so effectively and managing? There were so many questions in the chat, so I think you handled it really well. Um, thank everyone. Thank the speakers. I think we would just sum phenomenal contributions in fact they've all been phenomenal contributions this morning um, and I'll probably say this this afternoon when we've got a fuller house again but yet again the AGE just gets better and better and that's just really down to our members and the standard of work that they are they're producing through their research so thank you so much and um, for people who are joining us again this afternoon you've got a quick 15 minutes to grab some lunch and a quick comfort break and we'll see you again soon